निरंजनम निंतरूपम भक्तानुकृत विग्रह वै ईशावतार परमेश मेड्यम तम राम कृष्ण शीर्षा नमा नमस्ते एवरीवन एंड वेलकम टू आर स्टडी ऑफ द भगवत गीता स्टडिंग चैप्टर ट्वेल्व भक्ति योगा एंड दिस इज दी second class of on this particular chapter we had an introduction and uh, in our study group prashant had posted a question there for everyone to think and respond but we can start with prashant asking that and have a discussion and from there we can take that up so prashant yes what was the question again please uh, namaste swami ji Namaste, everyone. Um, basically, the question is: when we say bhakti, um, we think of surrender. Um, we think of letting go um, of our ego. So, when it comes to that, um, based off of those two references um, of the shlokas, the question I had was: when we say bhakti. Um, does it mean that full surrender is what we call bhakti because in our daily lives we talk so much of bhakti even when we do bhajan and all so the the question is is there some control of the senses that is involved when we talk of bhakti or or something you know my my interpretation is is not clear so so that's what i wanted to know sorry okay it's a good question and those who really want to understand bhakti as i mentioned i think in the last class to refer to narada bhakti sutras just like for dhyana meditation we have patanjali yoga sutras there is a text for narada bhakti sutras which is which discusses bhakti in all total details so bhakti devotion is an emotional attachment to the to the divine but it doesn't mean some sentimental emotional feeling for god only it means total dedication and in the narada bhakti sutras there there what is called navada bhakti nine types of or practices uh, for devotee to cultivate in the spirit of total surrender so it is not just singing some bhajans and doing some puja it is subjugating the jivatma totally to the parmatma to understand or to establish that relationship where the parmatma is the supreme being like the ocean and the jivatma is like the wave and the waves totally dependent on the ocean for its existence it has come out of the ocean at every moment it is sustained in uh, by the ocean all the energy that flows really comes from the ocean so and ultimately it merges back into the ocean so a devotee tries to establish this relationship in such a way that he feels that the wave is connected to the ocean all the time and that whatever happens through the body mind ego actually happens through the will of the divine the antaryam antaratma antaryami vina controller so in its proper practice of of bhakti uh in the gospel of shri ram krishna he also mentions uh the devotee totally offers his whole or her whole being to the divine whatever he eats he visualizes that the divine is present in his heart or her heart and this is an offering whatever you see that is offered whatever is taken through all the senses that's why it's called ahara ahara normally people interpret in a very literal sense as food that we eat but really ahara means anything that is taken into the system in, into us so not only through the mouth through the eyes ears 
all the sense organs is taken in a such a way that it is an offering to the divine that dwells in our heart. And then whatever he does or she does, so you've got the five karmendriyas, five organs of action, and the five jnanendriyas, five organs of knowledge. All those are dedicated to the divine. So it's this idea is beautifully expressed in one of the uh, stotras by Acharya Shankara, when he says, Atmatvam girijamati sahachara prana shariram griham. Pujate vishya upabhoga rachana nidra samadhi sthiti. Sanchara padayo pradakshina vidhi stotrani sarvagiro yadiyad karma karomi tattadakhilam sambho tavaradhanam. So this stotra is dedicated to Shiva sambho. And, and, and same thing, idea would be applied to if one were offering or praying to Krishna or Rama, any other divine personality. So the spirit of this whole thing is captures beautifully the idea of devotion, bhakti. Atma atvam, that means that jivatma that is in me, where the ego that I feel to be myself as an independent entity, really it is you who dwells in my heart. Girija Mati. Mati is Buddhi. The next manifestation. That is the Divine Mother. Girija. Giri means mountain. Ja means who is born of the mountain. So Mother Parvati is the daughter of the Himalayas. So she is called Girija. Girija is Mati. So basically the devotee spiritualizes himself or herself saying that ego that I have in me is really you or reflection of you, a part of you. Uh, the buddhi that is the divine mother, sahachara prana, the five pranas, pancha pranas, the vital forces due to which the physical body, mind and senses function, that is also uh, of divine origin. Sahachara means the companions, saha means going, chara means moving around. So these are your companions. Atmatum girija mati sahachara Prana shariram griham. This body is the house in which you dwell. Sanchara padayo pradakshina vidhi. Wherever I am going on my feet, let that be taken to be pradakshina, sekamambulation. When you go to the temple, we people sekamambulate. They go around and around the circle, uh, around the temple. And the idea is that I'm trying to reinforce that idea that you are the center of my universe, all my activities, and whatever I do, it's possible because you are the core of my existence. That's the meaning behind when, when we go to the temple and move around in a circle so many times. Sahachara prana sariram griham. Sanchara padayo pradakshina vidhi stotrani saravagiro. Giro means speech. Sarva means all. Sarva, all speech is stotras. Stotras are composed by rishis uh, to, in praise of the divine. That means whatever I speak, let that be, uh, let that express something of the divine glory. Means that speech much, much be, must, uh, should be aligned to some higher spiritual idea all the time as much as possible. Strotrani giro Atmatvam girijamati sahachara prana shariram giraham Puja te vishaya upabhoga rachana Puja te vishaya upabhoga rachana Vishaya upabhoga means whatever we consume through the five senses. Let that be an offering to you. Because you are the Antarayami dwelling in my heart. Pujate Vishya Upabhogarachana Nidra Samadhi Stiti. Even the act of sleeping is, is an act of communicating with the divine. Samadhi is when the Jivatma or the meditator and the, and the object of meditation become one. Sanchara Padayo Pradikshina Vidhi Stotrani Sarvagiro Yadiyat Karma Karomi. Whatever actions I do, Tatta Dakhilam, all in totally, totality. Tatta Dakhilam Sambho, Tavaradhanam. Let this be your Aradhana. 
So that beautifully captures uh, the spirit of devotion of a, of a devotee. So it's a total dedication. Uh, it's not just going to the temple on a particular day and offering some fruits and flowers and doing your pranams and making some prayers, requesting for uh, certain things. It is a total consecration of the Jivatma to the Paramatma. And as we practice that, then the because of that type of dedication and that communication with the divine, this whole body, mind, ego becomes purified. And in the pure mind, the divine is experienced. So yes, uh, I hope this sort of explains, answers your question a little bit. It is about turning the mind inwards, directing the senses inwards, engaging in activities that are meant to uh, integrate us to our spiritual dimension. And of course, japa, meditation, study of the scriptures, satsang, going into solitude now and then and contemplating deeply about the ultimate truth that is within us, the Atman, the eternal dimension of our being. At the same time, also uh, being mindful that everything else in this world is in time, space, and position, is in Jagat, therefore it's transitory. We can invest so much time in food and work and everything for to secure our livelihood, food, clothing, and shelter. But it's a greater purpose to coming into this world. And, and that must not be forgotten. So in the midst of all the activities, the compass of the the needle of the compass should point to the north of this ideal of self-realization. God realization. So happy with that uh, explanation, Prashant? Uh, yes, Swamiji. Uh, the one part of it, what I wanted to know was the correlation between Atma Samyama and Bhakti. Yeah, so Atma Samyama means restrain control of the senses. Okay, Samyama, but controlling and just restraining is one part of it. You know, some people are there, they restrain that energy that is harnessed when the senses are restrained has to be sublimated or directed in a uh, uh, for, for a spiritual purpose. So together along with that uh, self-control, control of the senses, basically freedom of the senses, freedom from the senses. Many times people say, I, I just want to have total freedom. And it means freedom of the senses, do whatever uh, without any uh, control, Actually, it should be in spiritual life, it is interpreted as, as freedom from the senses. The senses should not uh, drag you, take you wherever you are. In the Kathopanisha, this beautifully explained how this human being is. If we can use that analogy that, look, the body is the chariot, the five senses are the five horses yoked to the chariot. The reins, the rope by which the horses are held together is the mind. And the buddhi is the uh, intellect. The jivatma is the rider. And so the five horses, if they are not controlled and they are let, uh, uh, given the freedom to run wherever they want, then they will drag the chariot out in whichever direction they want. You are not in control. So uh, Sri Krishna says, you know, the Upanishads say that, the buddhi is the one that's going to control. That buddhi has to be awakened. It should have that alertness and discrimination. It should have a sufficient strength and control of the mind, which are the ropes. And with that help of the strong mind, the senses are restrained. And then only the buddhi can guide, uh, direct the horses uh, to the destination, the spiritual direction. Otherwise, when the buddhi is asleep uh, or drunk or absent-minded, and the mind is loose, not very strong, then one is at the mercy of the horses and they take us, drag us wherever they want. So, yes, control of the senses. Samyama has to be absolutely. Otherwise, uh, the energy that is flowing through the divine source, through the buddhi, through the mind, out through the senses and the body gets totally drained out and nothing much happens. That's why in all the spiritual paths, yama and yama, the first two stops, uh, steps of uh, uh, angas of the Patanjali Yoga Sutra is all about harnessing that energy, do's and don'ts. 
Don'ts means don't engage in these things. Why? They drag the mind out. They deplete you uh, of that energy that's within you and, and drains you out. Sort of, It's an outflow because it's connected to the external world. And do's is a constant effort to harness that energy that is there now, saved, but sublimate it and convert it into a spiritual energy. And that's where japa, meditation, swadhyaya, and all those things are to be practiced. Then that energy is transformed into a spiritual energy, which is called ojas. That energy is then harnessed into the brain. And then the what you call the subtle capacity of the mind uh, develops by which one can grasp that subtle truth, uh, which are explained and taught uh, in the scriptures. So samyama definitely, but it's not just simply samyama. It, uh, after saving that energy, you have to transform into something. Uh, another good example is if the river is flowing down the mountain, if you don't build a dam, all that water just drains out into the ocean. Nothing much is uh, harnessed out of it. But if you build a dam, now that building the dam is the samyama. So you get a huge dam full of water. But that energy is now to be transmitted or transformed into electricity. Only then it becomes useful. And so that is where the sadhana part comes out of it. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Anjay. Okay. Thanks yes. for the further clearer. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let me see. So today, let's continue from where we left. So the whole chapter started by uh, a question from uh, uh, Arjuna to Krishna. And he asked a question saying, there are two paths. One, where somebody is basically following the path of knowledge, contemplating on the Supreme Being, the Brahman, nameless, formless, beyond speech. We have discussed all those uh, attributes of Brahman, which is sort of told in a, a neti neti way. It's not this, it's not this. And then... The other, in chapter 11, Sri Krishna revealed himself as in the cosmic form and gave a more tangible visual uh, uh, aspect of the divine, which a devotee can visualize and contemplate on the qualities. And so the question, Arjuna's question was, if these two seekers are there, one taking the path of the absolute non-manifest Brahman, Jnana Maraga, and the other one is a devotee who contemplates on some uh, Sakara, divine aspect with form, and Saguna, with divine qualities, which of the two is better, superior? So normally, when we ask a question which is superior, we judge it from the end point of the result that is there, like which job is better, we'll say, well, which one pays more type of thing. But Sri Krishna doesn't answer the question in that way as if there are two different outcomes of the two paths. He says, look, both paths lead to the same goal. But uh, which is superior then becomes a question like, which is easier to reach? And of the two, Sri Krishna is very clear that, look, that path where one pursues klesho here, the avyakta asakta chedasam. That path uh, in uh, verse 5, uh, the, for those whose minds is attached to the unmanifest, the struggle is greater. For the goal which is the unmanifest is attained with great difficulty by the embodied being. Embodied being, Dehavad Bhir Avapyate, Dehavad. So, Shri, Shri Ram Krishna also says that, Annagata Prana, in Kali Yuga, we are so deeply attached to the physical body, to the external world, that while it might be intellectually very nice to talk about the I'm not the Atman, I'm the nameless, formless being. But in practice, uh, everyday experience, if you fall sick, then all that idea I'm, the, I'm not the Atman, I'm not the body, mind totally disappears. Uh, if hunger comes, so in this age, in this Kali Yuga, when people are very much attached to the physical body, the path of bhakti is an easier path, better path. Then Shri Krishna talks, talks about uh, Yetu Sarvani Karmani Mai Sanyasya Matpara Ananyena Yogena 
मां ध्यायंत उपासते तेषाम अहम समुद्धर्थ मृत्यु संसार सागरा भवामी न चिरात पार्थ मैया वेशित चेतसा दिस इज दि ब्यूटी ऑफ भक्ति योग बिकॉज द in the path of gyan ya marga the spiritual seeker has to do all the heavy lifting it is like you're trying to climb a mountain but you're trying to go straight up the steep slope to the peak while those who are going along the bhakti path they go spiraling around so it's a gentler slope they still reach the same goal but it's so easier uh, much easier than the gyan marga and the second important point that's to be uh, understood in bhakti marga is that the divine that we are praying to he becomes or she becomes very much involved in the spiritual journey of the seeker the devotee to the extent that much of the work is done by the divine like shri ramakrishna says if those who take one step towards god god takes 10 steps towards them much of the heavy lifting is done by them uh, so let's give us another example suppose this is a very tall building with say seven floors and somebody wants to reach that imagine there's a long rope hanging from the top of the building to the ground floor somebody says i'm going to climb uh, go to the top using this rope and you can understand that is a lot of hard work it requires a lot of stamina perseverance energy to reach the goal another person says okay i will access the staircase and so that is much easier requiring less energy compared to the person who is going up by the rope but then there can be a third method also where there is a lift in the building and the lift man comes down and you know there is a lift and press the button you have to get into the lift and the lift then takes you up so when the divine descends from the top to the level of the seeker and literally takes him up that type of manifestation of divine grace is called avatara and in every age he comes down for the devotees is not there for the gyanis uh the devotee the gyanis will not even acknowledge and receive that help but the devotee is looking out for that is able to recognize it and benefit from that wonderful opportunity comes so here in these two verses shri krishna talks about this tesham yetu sarvani karmani mai sanyasya matpara for the as for those who having dedicated all actions to me so actions of the mind body and spirit everything is now directed for that ultimate goal normally in our everyday life much of our activity is directed for things uh, of the world you know we we have to earn money we have to earn food we have we look for something from outside and then so the question might be okay if i dedicate all my whole life uh, to god what about my physical requirements what are my food clothing shelter and who's going to take care of things that i have uh, and things that i need well later in the bhagavad gita shri krishna says that look uh, for those who have totally surrendered themselves to to me i give this assurance that i will provide what they need and take care of what they have now not many people might have that type of faith and say that i can't take the risk uh, so a devotee in this process while he surrenders to the divine comes through diff- different experiences where that faith slowly grows and matures he starts with what is called vaidhi bhakti or apara uh, bhakti vaidhi bhakti means that is done through various vidhis and most people will start uh, in the spiritual journey in such a way uh, which involves you know your daily morning and evening puja lighting your lamp offering your fruits and flowers chanting your mantras doing so many rounds of a japa and meditating for so much time and all that 
uh, going to, on pilgrimages, uh, tirthas, celebrating various uh, festivals and all that. Uh, but it's more at a physical level. But you do it morning and evening sincerely. And that is his puja. And the meaning of the word puja is that which purifies. So if you do it with in the right spirit, over time, it brings about a change. It purifies the mind. It purifies the body. In that pure mind and body, one feels the awakening of that spiritual impulse. Uh, it could be those samskaras that have been inherited from your previous lifetimes. One has been pursuing the spiritual path. And in this life, when you engage in such practices again, you are in the company of such people, then those samskaras will arise, rise up from the subconscious mind to the surface and you suddenly feel that spiritual urge. You feel very comfortable. It's a natural type of thing. And depends on how much of those samskaras we have brought from our previous lifetime, from there we continue. You'll find that in some people, uh, they really take it into devotion or spiritual practices like a fish getting into the water. It's like very natural and people are surprised. Wow, how come such a person is so devoted and everything? Well, it didn't happen overnight. They have brought in things, the samskaras from a previous lifetime. And so that is a great help in the journey. So as we practice what is called Vaidhi Bhakti or Apara Bhakti, in time, some of these rigidness in the practice of those disciplines begins to drop off. That means you're not so much fastidious about all those uh, activities you did, like so much Japa, I have to keep account of this and this and that. But now in the heart of the devotee, uh, wells up that intense love and attraction for the divine. And he or she doesn't pay too much effort of interest about the external practices. Now he or she is just happy to contemplate on the divine all the time, meditate without too much of this external paraphernalia and all that. That, when one reaches that type of stage, it's called parabhakti. Parabhakti means the higher bhakti. So it's a spiritual journey. We start wherever we are, wherever we are comfortable with. But the idea is that we keep on moving forward. Sri Ramakrishna says, go forward, go forward. Egye jau, egye jau. Means in Bengali, he says, do not be complacent and be satisfied where we are. And he gives a beautiful parable of the woodcutter. And he says that, look, in a certain village, and there was a woodcutter who would go into the forest every day and cut a bundle of firewood and bring it out and sell it uh, in the market. And that's how he earned his livelihood. One day when he was coming out of the forest, he ran into a brahmachari who said to him, go forward. And so that night he came back and thought about it. Why did he ask me to go forward? Let me next day go deeper into the forest. And he went and he came across this uh, section of the forest that was full of sandalwood. A chewed sandalwood. So, so happy. And he chopped down those trees of wood and took them out in the market and made really good money. And he was very happy, he became rich. Then he was thinking about uh, the same instruction. He said, ask me to go forward. Let me go deeper into the forest. So he went deeper and came across a silver mine. And of course, he became very uh, wealthy. And then every time he thought about that, he went deeper. And he came across the gold mine, the diamond mine. The idea is that, that in the spiritual journey, one should not become complacent and say, okay, so much and so is my devotion and things. There are always greater things spiritually within us and one must not settle down and be complacent that, okay, I'm just a good devotee doing my puja and this and that, that's all I have done and that's all I had time. No, one must try to go deeper and deeper in the beginning, all the rituals and ceremonies are there to help us in the journey. Ultimately, you'll find that it is all about manas puja. The devotee simply doesn't have any of physical things to offer. He offers his whole body, mind, and soul to the to the divine. And, and so that is where para bhakti comes.
in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, you'll read and see a wonderful example of all this in his own as an illustration of that. So Sri Krishna says, Yetu Sarvani Karmani Mai Sanyasya Matpara. Those who have dedicated all their actions to me. That means here it means dedicating the action not has two meaning. One is that you feel you are the doer, the results that come. You offer that to me. At the end of your work, you say, Shri Krishna Arpanamastru, Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastru. But a more advanced devotee will have the conviction that this doership that he feels in his own heart is not really an enlightened way of understanding of things. Actually, God alone is the doer. God here doesn't mean some extra extra cosmic being somewhere out in the clouds is remotely operating us. It means that consciousness that I feel, I'm a conscious being, I'm thinking, I'm uh, acting through uh, 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 the body and the mind uh, and the senses, all the activities, there's a sense of doership. What the devotee understands in his pure mind is that that doership is not, or that consciousness is not a property of the body or the brain or the mind. Actually, consciousness is per se an independent self-existence. That's the supreme being. That's what we call God. And everything in this world actually is a product of that consciousness. Uh, and that the divine being the primary cause actually is the real doer. The human being is only a puppet. The string is pulled by the divine. And therefore, the, he, he surrenders the doership to the divine also. That is what is called matured bhakti. And a person uh, is not only understanding this intellectually, they will feel that, uh, of course, the deep conviction is there that this consciousness is not a product of anything matter, material. But that consciousness is like the electricity invisible that flows through the bulb which is visible and that makes that light come out so this light is the manifestation of that energy uh, and without the electricity nothing happens so the real source of that power which later on manifests as light is that invisible electricity in this way that real source of that energy is that consciousness which is called divine and with that understanding he surrenders his doership to that that is the real devotion and what is Sri Krishna is trying to tell Arjuna aham kara vimudatma karta aham iti manyate a deluded person vimudatma has this feeling aham kar that egotistic feeling that karta aham I am the doer and that is a product of ignorance and therefore it brings misery because when you are the doer, then we appropriate to ourselves the result of that action. And if it's good, successful, then we are happy. And when it is opposite, then we become miserable. Like a pendulum, we swing between the success and failure, gain and loss. But there is a point in that pendulum which does not swing, which is where it is anchored to the, the string where it is tied. And so if we go deep inside ourselves, beyond the body, beyond the mind, beyond the senses and everything, we come to the center of our being where the whole world is whirling around it, this tremendous madness, but we are that immovable, unshakable, uh, anchored in that reality of, of the divine. And we feel that this body and mind is only an instrument of the divine. So Sri Ramakrishna says in various ways, he says, Oh mother, I'm the chariot, you are the driver. I'm the house, you are the indweller. Whatever happens, happens by thy will. Uh, or that beautiful story of Rama Richa, everything happens by the will of Rama. Good, bad, whatever happens, it is possible only because of the divine consciousness behind us, behind everyone else. Uh, so having that bigger picture uh, where our understanding of ourselves is not only a human being, body, 
mind and ego, but it is integrated to the ultimate reality, which is like the way it is now feeling itself to be always connected to the ocean and to maintain that awareness in the midst of activities also. So that type becomes a, a type of spiritual dis discipline, sadhana. Every time the ego rears his head up, you knock it down and say, hey, look, you are only an instrument. You are not the ultimate cause or source of all things and subjugate it. When, uh, so to give it a, a, a little bit of understanding how we might represent it, imagine there's a fraction. A fraction, there's a numerator and denominator. Let the numerator be the Paramatma. Let the denominator be the Jivatma. And of course, you don't have much say about what the, the numerator is, but the denominator can decide whether it will try to make itself bigger or smaller. So surrender means it tries to make itself smaller and smaller and smaller. Naham, naham, naham. Not I, not I, not I. And as it becomes itself smaller and smaller, then the total fraction becomes bigger and bigger. And when it becomes zero, I'm nothing, then the result is infinity. So this is some of the way sort of trying to say that we all want to be great in infinite, but a devotee subjugates himself totally, herself totally to the Paramatman. And in that way, it regains its ultimate, the same goal which a Jnani says, and the Gyani, what does he say? He says, I am the ocean. Chidananda Rupo, Shivoham, Shivoham. And he tries to assert that. Even while he's trying to, having that experience of the Jivatma Limited. And so, unless one has a tremendous willpower and tremendous uh, uh, strength of mind, it will just become an intellectual gymnastic. It's easier to follow the path of devotion. Yetu sarvani karmani mai sanyasya matpara. Matpara means who have, para means the highest, having ex, accepted me as a supreme goal. Uh, and then, ananyena, yogena. So, that means single-minded concentration. And for that, one needs to have one aspect of the divine. So this is a special concept in the Sanatan Dharma in Hinduism where a spiritual seeker will have what is called an Ista Devata. One pointed dedication and devotion to his or her chosen ideal. There are so many gods and goddesses in Hinduism. And it is, but for a spiritual seeker, he will choose one, knowing that all are manifestations of the same universal being, Brahman. But you require a one-point focus. Otherwise, the mind is here today, tomorrow is elsewhere. That does not mean, and sometimes people misunderstand when I, when I say this, oh, so we should not pray, pray to other gods and goddesses. No, no, that's not the meaning. It means that you will see your own chosen ideal in all gods and goddesses. So have the understanding that all the gods and goddesses are manifestations of the same being, same your chosen ideal. Just like when Sri Krishna revealed himself, then Arjuna saw in the Vishwarup, the universal cosmic form. So all the gods and goddesses, part of that universal being who was present in front of him in the uh, cosmic form as well as in the human form. So this is something important. Otherwise, uh, we don't have that intensity and depth. We are just floating here and there type of thing. And so, if somebody does this, it's not easy to do that. Later on, Sri Krishna himself will tell, I know this is not so easy. Yetu sarvani karmani. All the actions you are supposed to uh, devote to me. And you have to consider me as a supreme goal, total. And then you have to have this single-minded concentration on me, meditating and thinking of me. Maam dhyayantu pasate. If one is able to do this, then... What comes then? Tesham aham samudharana. So this is where the lift man comes. He said, okay, I'm going to step into your life and I'm going to make certain things happen. I'll come down to your level. Avatara. 
comes from the meaning is the one who has descended, come down to the human plane in a human form, moves and talks uh, like another human being. So we can relate to that person. And you feel that uh, he can understand us and I can understand him. He talks in our language, in simple language, not Sanskrit or some very high philosophy. And it's not about just teachings that he gives, but literally he holds our hands and lifts us up. That is the power of incarnation. And you see that all the incarnations have that same message. Christ says, come unto me all who are heavy laden and I shall give thee rest. So like this, Sri Krishna says, ultimately at the end of this Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Sarva Dharmani, uh, 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 Saranda renounce all actions to me and I will take care of all, whatever you require, basically. So to them, Tesham Aham Samudharta, Tesham, for these, such people who are solely devoted to meditation upon a manifestation of God through bhakti. What do I do? Tesham? What are this type of people? Mai Aveshita Chetasam. Aveshita means whose minds are Chetasa. Cheta means uh, the mind. Aveshita means totally absorbed into me, merged into me. So this is the condition. For those whose minds have now become totally absorbed into me, Constantly, they think of the divine, they repeat the mantra, they always uh, remind themselves morning and evening and daytime through the midst of all activities that the ultimate goal and the only one goal of life is to uh, unite the Jivatma with the Paramatma. And it's not a difficult path uh, or a, a hard path in the sense. In the path of bhakti, it is very sweet. It's like the mind is naturally attracted to, to the form of God. One does not really make have to make a lot of effort. In the beginning, some effort is necessary where you practice all those japa and mantra and puja. But at some point, the, the flow of the mind becomes very natural. Just like in a human relationship. If you love somebody, you don't have to tell yourself that now it's a time I should think about that person. So many times, naturally, your mind goes in that direction. And when it goes there, it's not like that you are forcefully trying to keep there. It is, enjoys that type of company. And, and, and uh, so bhakti is very, very sweet and very, very natural. Uh, and, and it becomes very much easier. It just gathers this momentum like a, like a moth that will go towards the fire. Okay, to the light. When he sees the light, it will just go towards that. Like that, the mind will become so enchanted with the divine that it doesn't really have to make much effort. Natural flow is there. Tesham eva samudharta mrityu sansara sagarat bhavami nachirat partha maya veshita chetasam. Mai aveshita chetasam. Those whose minds have slowly but systematically become absorbed in me. Then I become Aham bhavami, nachirat, without delay. So it's not like that, okay, you keep on practicing all this and then one fine day in some lifetime down there, I will come. No, uh, he comes uh, gently, quickly. Samudharta, what does he become? The deliverer, some udharth. We say udhar karna, deliver somebody, save somebody. So samudharta, from what? Deliver from what? Sagarat, the ocean. Uh, what type of ocean? Sansar, where we are coming and going. The waves are rising and falling. The jiva is appearing and disappearing. And what type of uh, ocean? Mrityu Sansar Sagarat, which is fraught with death. That means the sea of transmigration, which is in which life and death are uh, in. Uh, part and parcel of the whole existence. How to put an end to that? And so this is the promise of the divine. Okay, the same Brahman who is nameless and formless assumes the form of a particular aspect of God according to the temperament and the tendencies of the devotee. 
whichever way he approaches him, in that way, the divine reveals him to him. But he's not simply a passive person sitting there and say, okay, you keep on coming, ultimately you'll reach me. No, he becomes very engaged in the, in the devotee's uh, spiritual pursuit and reaches out and helps them. So, Deshamaham Samudhartha, Vrityu Sansara Sagarat, Bhavami Nachirat Partha, Maya Vishit Chetasam. Oh, Arjuna, for them who have their minds absorbed in me, I become without delay the deliverer from the sea of the world, which is fraught with death. One of the qualities of a true devotee is that he or she totally le learns to totally surrender to the divine in good times and bad times. Maybe in the beginning that type of surrender would not be there. But as it the devotion matures, then even for smallest of things, they do not exert themselves so much. And it's not that that faith has just popped up from nowhere. Through their spiritual journey, they would have come across so many experiences where they understand uh, that the divine is very much involved, providing whatever is necessary and taking care of whatever they have. There's a nice story about how much we depend on God and how much we depend on ourselves and accordingly the divine response. So one day, Lord Vishnu in Vaikuntha was sitting there with Mother Lakshmi giving a little bit of massage on his legs and they're having some conversation and suddenly he says, oh, I have to go to go. And so he got up and left and Mother was sitting there and then after a while he came back and so mother asked, so what is, what happened? Oh, one of my devotees is there. This fellow all the time contemplates and takes my name, sings my bhajan, and he doesn't even know what's happening around him. So I saw that he was walking on the bank of the river and these dhobis, the washerman had washed so many clothes and they had put it on the grass to dry. This fellow is so immersed in my, singing my name that he did not, does not even see where he's going. So he steps over this close and the, this Dhobis got very angry. They were coming to beat him up and therefore I was going to save him. Then she asked, so why did he come back? No, no, I saw that uh, when these Dhobis were trying to beat him, he turned around and picked up a stick to defend himself. So I came back. So when we try to solve our own problems, then God says, okay, Okay, I don't, I'm not needed right now. Uh, it's something that comes naturally. It's not like any one time, this time I'm only just doing just to test. That way we can't uh, sort of uh, stimulate or fake that type of devotion. But those type of uh, devotees who totally depend on God or the Divine Mother in this way. Wonderful example is to see Sri Ramakrishna's life. All the things that he needed for his sadhana, for his work, for his food, clothing, shelter, everything is provided by the Divine Mother. She herself manages it. And the devotee is simply like a helpless child. There are two types of devotees. Uh, and, and Sri Ramakrishna gives the example uh, of a baby kitten and a baby monkey. So, the kitten doesn't know very much and is born and the eyes are still closed. The mother has to take total care of it. Whenever it needs some attention, it feels hungry, it just does the mew, mew sound and whatever, wherever the mother is, she'll come and she'll feed and sometimes she puts the kitten in the bed, under the bed, near the fireplace, wherever. The kitten totally depends on the mother cat. But the baby monkey doesn't have that, that type of dependence. It as, uh, what you call depends a bit on its own strength. So uh, when the mother monkey is moving around, the baby monkey clings to the mother through the strength of you know by holding on to the mother. Sometimes it's hanging on the mother's uh, chest uh, or sitting on the back. Uh, but the risk is there that it can lose its grip and fall. So that little bit of self-effort. Uh, is there in some devotees 
In others, there is the total dependence. All devotees are not alike. So, this is the promise of Sri Krishna in the path of devotion. And so, the instruction is given what is to be practiced. Now comes a couple of verses about how ultimately uh, the devotee's mind will be engaged with the Soha chosen ideal. And uh, having set the goal, Sri Krishna has in the verse number seven promised that in this path, if you approach me, I will come and deliver you from the cycle of coming and going in this world, which is very good. So what is to be done? In the beginning, my eva man adhaswa, my buddhim nimeshaya, neva shishasi my eva, atha urtvam na samshaya. Have no doubt. Doubt is a tremendous problem. After hearing and listening all this, then this doubt will creep in somewhere. What if he doesn't come? What if he this doesn't happen? And that unsettles the whole thing. When there's faith, shraddha, you'll find this a beautiful flow of energy. When doubt comes, that flow gets somehow interrupted, disturbed, and unsettled things. So even for devotees, Sri Ramakrishna would say, do not get too much involved in this intellectual gymnastics. Don't reason too much. Reason cannot explain to you the, uh, about the emotional or the devotional part of things, uh, of the spiritual part. And too much of intellectual reasoning trying to depend on the capacity of that intellect to give you the ultimate truth itself uh, is not uh, uh, a safe part because this intellect itself is clouded, confused. If it cannot even manage some of the things of this world, how can it understand the subtle truths of the spiritual things? So it's not a very reliable tool. It can take you to some extent, to the outer court, but it will not let you enter within. So, my eva man adhaswa. Okay. I think it's almost time to end today. Uh, maybe we should take this verses from eight in the next class. I would like you to read at least the next three or four verses. My eva manadhaswa, my buddhim niveshaya, nivashishasi my eva, atha urtvam na samshaya. And then he says, I'm asking to do that, but if you can't do that, then what will you do? So he gives a couple of other alternatives. He says, atha chittam samadhatum na saknoti mai sthiram, abhyasa yogena tato maamichhaptum dharanjaya. If, however, you are unable to establish that mind steadily on me, then seek to reach me, O Arjuna, through the practice of yoga abhyasa, yoga of practice. And then he says, some people will say, I'm trying to do that. And we have this common uh, thing from our devotees. I'm trying to meditate, but my mind is not constant. It goes everywhere. So, listen, Sri Krishna understood this problem. And he says, look, Abhyasyapi asamarthosi mat karma paramo bhava madartama api karmani kuruvan siddhi mavapshasi If you are even unable even to practice, that means you can't, keep, when you sit down for meditation, you are not able to hold the mind for a long time the divine. Then, what do you do? You get up and do various activities. All right, work. But be intent on working for me. Don't work for yourself. By undertaking works for me as well, you will attain perfection. So he's given a second. So the first one was you give your total mind. Second, you do abhyas yoga. You can't do abhyas yoga. You go do karma yoga, but dedicate your mind to me. And then he says, okay, what about if you can't do that also? Well, if you are unable to do even this, that means work for me. In that case, having resorted to the yoga for me, therefore renounce the result of all actions by becoming controlled in the mind. So 
while doing work you are not totally able you are not able, uh, able to maintain that i am not the doer you still have a sense of doer and therefore some results will come but dedicate that result of work to me sarva karma phala tyaga sarva karma all actions karma phala all the results of action tyagam renounce don't appropriate and take that to be yours know that i am the real dua sitting inside your heart it is by my power through which all the intellect the mind the senses and the bodies op operate therefore the real dua is the divine and therefore the result of all actions should rightfully be offered and dedicated to him so a couple of options are given there and we will take this uh, up next week uh, it's not no, try to understand this uh, in the sense okay subjectively which one applies to you and so do a deep understand analysis uh, are you able to give your whole mind totally maybe not can i uh, practice uh, keeping the mind on the divine through the through abhyas yoga maybe that's not happening okay then successively uh which one you can practice and that will be the one for you to 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 apply in your life so we'll take this up it's not very difficult to understand but it requires some deep thinking and application uh, and each one will apply these teachings according to where they are in their spiritual journey so this is sort of like a map and we are in different stages what will apply to one will not apply to another which one has to contemplate seriously and see how it can be benefited from uh, study of the gita and these classes and discussions that we are having with this let us offer the results of this class today to the divine Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Rityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu